teach that. The Roman Catholic Church has put forth the concept of purgatory. That is, you die and you go into a holding place. If you're not good enough to go to heaven, you will go to purgatory and you will stay there temporarily until your sins have been paid for. And then you can transition into a place of reward. The Bible doesn't teach that. And very common in our current day is the idea that when you die, you simply cease to exist. That is, when you breathe your last breath, it truly will be the last coherent thought that you ever have. Brother, this is a question everybody thinks about. Whether you are an atheist, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, everyone thinks about what will happen when they die. Some time back, we took the video version of this lesson and we put it on YouTube. The last time I had checked, it had been viewed 1.6 million times. Why is that? Because everybody thinks about this question. Now, as Christians, we don't have to engage in these guessing games. Because we can know the answers to the question, not only where we came from, but we can know where we're going. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to open our Bibles, and we're going to answer this question, where do we go when we die? Now, I have put together a chart that is going to help us, that's going to help us trace the journey tonight. Now, I want you to look at this with me. In fact, when we get to the end of the chart, usually at the end of this sermon, people always ask me, where can I get a copy of that chart? I have been asked so many times, we put it online. If you go to wherewewegowhenwedie.com, the video was there and the chart is there. You can download those for free, and we encourage you to use them and to preach this material. Where do we go when we die? When I first wrote this sermon some years ago, I entitled this sermon, The Soul from birth to eternity. The soul from birth to eternity. But when I got to thinking about that, it occurred to me that that was the wrong title. Because you see, the soul of man doesn't begin at birth. The soul of man begins when? At conception, right? Now, I want to read a passage to you. This is Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. This is a passage we oftentimes use to describe death, but it tells us something very important about the beginning of life. Listen to this. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9 calls God the Father of spirits. And so I want you to watch this when I click it. You see the arrow coming down out of heaven? I added that to the chart to represent the fact that God gives us, gives us our spirit. And so what that means section, when an egg is sperm, a new life is created, and God places a soul into that new teeny tiny human being. Mom and Daddy give that child its physical characteristics, but they don't give him a soul. God gives him his soul. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said this, Let us, that is, the Godhead, let us make man after our own image, after our likeness. What does that mean that we're made in the image of God? Brother, I think there's a lot of things entailed in that, but primarily it has reference to the fact that I have a soul. I am a soul. I am a being that once I was created, I will live forever somewhere. Animals don't have that. We are far superior to the animals in that sense. And so we're conceived, a soul is placed in us, and that soul will continue to dwell in my physical body until I die. Listen to what the Bible says. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. That's interesting that the physical body is called a tent. I'm going to say some more about that in a minute. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 calls our body mortal. It calls it corruptible. And so what that means is this. For 70 years, 80 years, however long I live, my soul is going to dwell in this body. The Lord calls it a tent. Incidentally, why does he call it a tent? A tent's temporary, right? If you go camping, you go out of the woods, you're not going to take brick and mortar because you're just there a short time to you set up a tent. The Lord calls our body a tent. It is a temporary housing for the soul. And so what that means, for 70 years, my soul dwells in this tent. Now during that time, I'm going to worship God. We worshiped God just a moment ago in singing. And when I did that, I engaged my mouth, I engaged my lips, I breathed, air came over my vocal cords, and my physical body was involved in worship. But brethren, the scene of worship is not this. When I worship God, I do it with my spirit, right? John 1, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For years, I'm going to worship God, and I'm going to do it with my soul, or I don't. During that time, 
I'm going to love God, but I do it with my spirit. I do it with my soul. Luke chapter 10, verse 27 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. And so I love God with my spirit, or I don't. I'm going to make that choice. For 70 years or 80 years, I'm going to do that. All the while, this tent is wearing out. Now, Solomon describes the wearing out of the body very eloquently in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. That is, when a person begins to get aged and their body wears out, they have aches and pains. And sometimes people get near the very end of their life and they say, I'm ready to go. This is difficult. I'm ready to go and be with the Lord. Remember the Lord before you get old and the difficult days come. And the years draw nigh that you say, I have no pleasure in them. He says, while the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened, that as you get old and your eyesight begins to fail. He says, the clouds do not return after the rain. He says in the days that the keepers of the house begin to tremble. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about your hands. You get old and he says your hands begin to tremble. He says the strong men bow themselves because they are weak. He's talking about your legs. Your legs give out and you fall down. He says when the grinders cease because they are few. What's that talking about? Talking about your teeth. Your teeth fall out. He says they that look through the windows grow dim. He says the doors are shut in the street. The sound of grinding is low. When one rises up at the sound of a bird, you don't sleep as well as you did as a young person. He says, and the sound of music is brought down. You can't hear like you did. He says there are cranks. Why would you be afraid of heights? Well, if your legs are giving out, you might fall down. You don't want to be in a high place. He says there is terror in the way. And the almond tree blossoms. What's he talking about when he says the almond tree blossoms? If you ever look at an almond tree when it's blooming, it's just a beautiful gray, it's a beautiful white, and he said you get old and the head, so you, the hair of your head looks like that. It's a beautiful white, it's a beautiful gray, the leaves, and uh, now for some of us the leaves just fall out, but it's the same thing that he's talking about there. He says the grass is a burden. A very small thing is a burden. Desire fails. You don't have the same desires you did. Man goes to his eternal home. Mourners go about the street. Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed and the golden bowl is broken. That is, you die. Now listen. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Now that brings us to our question. What happens then? He says, for 70 years, for 80 years, my soul has been dwelling in this temporary body, this tent. All that time this body is wearing out, is getting weak, and it dies. What happens to my soul when I die? So he says, the days of our years are 70 years. If I reach this strength, they are 80. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off. Now listen to this part, I like this. And we fly away. He says, you might live to be 70. If you're strong, you might live to be 80. If you're really strong, you might live longer than that. But then he says, the time comes, your body dies. I like this part. We fly away. When I die, the part of me that is really me continues to exist. Genesis 35 and verse 18, the Bible describes for us the death of Rachel. And it uses very fascinating language. The Bible says this, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing. Isn't that interesting? The Bible, says, the Bible says when we die, we fly away. When Rachel died, the Bible says her soul was departing. James 2 and verse 26 says the body without the spirit is dead. That is the biblical definition of death is when your soul leaves your body. And so when I die, my soul leaves my body and leaves the tent. But the question we want to know tonight is where does it go? What happens to me when I die? Now somebody says, well, not on the day of resurrection, we're going to get a new body. We're going to get an incorruptible body. And that's right. In fact, listen to what the Bible says about that. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, that is right now in a tent, is temporary. One day I'm going to get a resurrected body, and it's not going to wear out. The Lord refers to that as a building. It's incorruptible. But listen to verse 4. For we who are in the tent groan, being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. Now folks, there's some very interesting language here. Because he speaks of being in this body as being in a tent. He speaks of the resurrected body as being clothed in a building, eternal.
eternal in the heavens, but then he speaks about being unclothed. When is that going to occur? Listen to me. It's when I die and my soul leaves this body, but I, the day of resurrection hasn't come, so I haven't gotten the resurrected body. There's going to be a period of time when my soul, my spirit, doesn't have, will be unclothed, if you will. That's the language the Bible uses. And so where does my spirit go? Where does my soul go when I die? Because to the next part of our chart here. I want you to look at this with me. I have put a little bridge on here, indicate representing that all of us are one day going to take. I want you to notice I've got two roads. I've got a narrow road and I have a wide road. That's because Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that enter in there at. That's the narrow road. But then verse 14, you've got the wide road. That is wide, broad in destruction, and many there be that go in there at. I want you to remember that. We're going to come back to know the two arrows on the chart. We've got one representing the saved and one representing the lost. Those representing the saved will travel the narrow road. Those representing the lost will travel the wide road. And we're going to revisit that at the end. But you see, bridge represents the journey that we will all take. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto me. I hear people say this. They will say, I, And I went to heaven, and then I came to about You ever hear somebody say that? Last several years, you know what? I don't believe that. Because the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. Since the days of miracles have been over, people don't die but one time. So where does my soul go when it takes this journey that we call death? Now that's going to take us to the second part of this chart. This entire second section is Hades. This is the Hadean realm. Now I want you to understand, because people get confused about this, people think that Hades refers to torment. They think that the word Hades refers to hell. That is not correct. The word Hades really means the dwelling place of the dead. Hades is a holding area for disembodied spirits. The good people who die go to Hades. I think part of the reason this is because the King James for Hades, that is Hades, and the word for hell, which is Gehenna, it's two different Greek words. One is the dwelling place of the dead, and one is the eternal place of punishment, but it has translated both of these words as hell. Now that's caused a great deal of confusion. In the Greek, they are two different words, Hades and Gehenna. Hades is the place of the dead. The King James translates both of them as hell, and it's confused us. For instance, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word's not hell in the original. The word is Hades. Jesus said, the gates of Hades. Hades is the dwelling place of the dead. Jesus was saying this, death is not going to stop my kingdom. That's what. For three years he'd been telling his disciples to preach the kingdom. I'm going to establish my kingdom. And now he's about to die. And they might think, well, it's not going to come. And he said, upon this rock I will build my church. And death is not going to stop my kingdom. That's what that passage means. Now, if you don't know the distinction between these two words, you're going to get very confused. Now, incidentally, in the Old Testament, now, in the New Testament, the word Hades is the Greek word for the dwelling place of the dead. In the Old Testament, it is the Hebrew word, the word is Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. Sheol is the Hebrew word, is it's the same place. Sheol and Hades are the dwelling place of the dead. Now, brethren, once you understand that all people go to Hades when they die, it will clear up some things for you. For instance, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 31, the Bible refers to Christ after his death as being in Hades. As hell. Jesus did not go to the King James verse reads. Luke 23, 43, Christ as he was about to die, you remember that he told the thief on the cross, the day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now you put these two passages together, Acts 2, 31, Jesus went to Hades, he went to paradise. When you understand that paradise is in the Hadean realm, it makes perfect sense. Now, some people have built a false doctrine around this, suggesting that when Jesus died, he went to hell and paid and suffered hell for us. That is false, and the Bible doesn't teach that, and it is based on this description from King James Version. Now, the best description I know in the Bible of Hades is in Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. So I want to read it together, and then we're going to make some observations. Luke 16 and verse 19, the Bible says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and for sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar in England, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the 
bridge fans were cleaning. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel of his bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell, this is actually the word Hades, and in Hades he lifted up his eyes, went, and seeth Abraham are all, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou and I like to receive us thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now listen to this, verse 26. And besides all of this, between us is they who would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us who would come from thence. Now let's break this table cap. First, I want to talk about the place where Lazarus was taken. We are told that Lazarus died, and he's carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Brethren, this is the compartment of Hades of where the righteous go to await judgment. This is at the top of the chart. This is the place known as paradise. This is the same place that Jesus had in mind when he said to the people on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. In fact, Luke 16, 25 tells us in this place the righteous are comforted. If you do a word study, and you, you, you look at the etymology of the word paradise, history of this word, it comes from a history I've oftentimes heard that when they do surveys of people, and they ask, what is the thing you fear most in the world, almost always at the top of the list, is death. Could that be the reason that when the righteous die, there are angels waiting to escort us into paradise? Isn't that a beautiful thought? When a righteous person dies, he doesn't open his eyes in torment. He puts his eyes to angels, at least two, escorting him into paradise. What is that? It's the Lord saying, don't fear. I'm here with you. And you will be escorted to paradise. Now look at the bottom of the chart. This is the place where the rich man was taken. This is the place of torment. This is the place in Hades that is called Tartarus in the original Greek. Peter uses this same word in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 when he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to, and the King James says, Hell, the word is Tartarus here. He cast them down to Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness to await the day of judgment. Listen how this place is described. 22, it says, The rich man also died and was buried. Now listen to verse 23. And in hell, and Hades is the word, and in Hades lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He lifted up his eyes in the Hadean realm specifically, and brethren, he did not have angels escorting him. Normally, when I preach on this subject, I like to spend some time and talk about the misery of this place. The suffering of this place. We could spend a whole lesson on this. I have a whole lesson just on this. But very briefly, I want you to appreciate with me that the rich man is burning in fire. He is crying and begging for mercy. He believes that one drop of water on the tip of his tongue will bring him some relief. I also want you to appreciate with me that every beginning of time until now who has died lost in the eyes of God is in that place. Some of them have been there for thousands of years. Some of them for months. Some of them, no doubt, for seconds, for moments. Now, another thing I want you to notice is that there is consciousness in the Hadean realm. There is a doctrine that is taught by some in the religious world. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach this. It is called soul sleeping. And they teach that when a person dies, that he goes into a state of unconsciousness and he is not aware of anything until the night. Ladies and gentlemen, this passage, as well as many others, teach us that when we die, we are very much aware of what's going on. The rich man, he's in pain, crying. Lazarus is comforted. You know, Psalm 116 and verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I don't think the Bible is telling us it's precious to God when we become unconscious. We're being told it is precious to God when we enter into reward. I preached on this subject one time in a congregation in Tennessee, and a brother walked, and he said, Don, that was a great lesson. He said, we're wrong about there being consciousness in the Hadean realm, and he folded up a piece of paper, and he walked off. Of course, I was very curious, and it had written on it, he'd, he'd written this girl, Ecclesiastes 9.5, the dead know not anything. And so he was saying, that means when you die, you don't know anything. Incidentally, that's the same way the Jehovah's Witnesses use that verse. 
But really, here's the problem. He was taking that verse out of context. If you read, he, he cited Ecclesiastes 9.5. If you look at Ecclesiastes 9.6, you will see the phrase, under the sun. If you look at Ecclesiastes 9.3, under the sun, 9.9, under the sun, 9.13, under the sun, over and over and over throughout Ecclesiastes 19, or Ecclesiastes chapter 9, he's discussing things that take place under the sun. You know what that means? If we go back to our chart here and we look at this world, this is the realm that's under the sun. What he's talking about is things that took place back on this earth. And he's saying the dead, the people in the Hadean realm, they don't know what's going on back here under the sun. What that is teaching us then is when you die and leave this life, you don't know what's going on back in this world. Now, I know that's contrary to what we're oftentimes taught. I know that there was a song out several years ago, Steve Warner did it, it's called a country music song. There are, there are holes in the floor of heaven. You remember that song? And the idea of the song was a man's wife had died and the man had to, to raise his daughter alone and the day came and she got married and it rained and he said it was tears from heaven and mom was watching over you. And, and I know we like that, it's kind of a romantic and comforting idea, but the Bible says when we die and we go into Hades, we don't know what's going on in this realm. And that makes sense. Could you imagine Earth and seeing all the terrible things happening here? I can't comprehend that. Now somebody says, well, Don, no, I disagree with you. I, I don't think you're right about this. I can prove this. Second Chronicles chapter 34, God told King Josiah that he was going to bring punishment upon Jerusalem for their sins. But he told Josiah, you're going to die before I do that. And so this is what he says, Second Chronicles 34 and verse 28. He says, I will gather you unto your fathers. You shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Listen, therefore your eyes will not see the calamity that I bring upon this place and its inhabitants. What's the point of that? He said, you're going to die. Therefore, you're not going to see it. You see, the Bible says the dead go not anything under the sun. Okay, one final thing I want you to notice about the Hadean realm. I want you to notice this. Do you see the green here? This green line is representing the fact that there is a divide between paradise and torment. There is a chasm that is there. There is, if to use the language of the Bible, there is a great gulf that is fixed, according to Luke 16, 26. And the Bible says, no man can cross from one side to the other. That means if you die and go to paradise, you are there to stay until the day of judgment. If you die and you go to torment, you are there to stay until the day of judgment. That means that the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory, that you go into the place of reward and then you transition into the, or you go into the place of suffering and you transition to the place of reward, is a false doctrine. The Bible says that is not correct. It also means that every person who has died unfaithful in the eyes of God is still there. Some of them for thousands of years. And I think about them crying, I'm tormented in this flame. But they get no relief. It never ends. Now, the next part of our chart here is the resurrection. The resurrection day we typically refer to as the judgment day. The Bible more often calls it the day of the Lord. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. Now, here's the question. What is going to happen on that day to the souls that are in the Hadean realm. On the day of resurrection, on the day of judgment, what's going to happen to the people who are in paradise and the people who are in torment? Listen to it carefully because I don't want you to get the wrong impression here. On that day, this world is going to give up its souls. Hades, for this world's bodies. Hades is going to give up its souls and they will be reunited. Now, hold on, I know what you're thinking. Listen to what the Bible says. John 5, 28 says, For the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, that's the Greek word for tombs, they shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And so what's going to happen is this world is going to give up its bodies. They will be resurrected. Hades will be emptied of souls, and they will be reunited. But here's the thing. This body is not going to be like this body. The resurrected body is going to be different. It's not going to be made of the same particles, if you will. It's not going to be material, for lack of a better word. Sometimes people have expressed to me concern about cremation. In fact, I remember, I've been asked this a lot of times over the years, but I remember specifically a sister in Christ coming to me on one occasion, and she said, the brother Don, is it wrong to be cremated? And I said, no, there's nothing wrong with being cremated. I said, why, why do you ask that? She said, it seems to me like that is going to be a problem on the day of resurrection. 
the, the Lord's going to resurrect our body. She said, that seems like that's going to be problematic. Brethren, it's not going to be a problem. Because you see, the body that's going to be resurrected is not this flesh and blood body. It is different from that. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The resurrected body is not going to be flesh and blood. It's not going to be a tent. It's going to be a building. In fact, listen to me four describing the resurrected body. It says the body, the physical body, is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Let me break that down very quickly. He says that our resurrected body will be incorruptible. Remember, our current bodies, they wear out. We lose our eyesight. We get old. This body dies. He says the resurrected body is not going to be like that. He says the resurrected body is going to be glorious. If we would be honest, there are many things associated with our current bodies that are lowly, that are vile. He says the resurrected body is not going to be like that. The resurrected body, he says, will be raised in power. Our current bodies get tired, they get sick, they are subject to allergies, we have to go to sleep, we have to rest. He says the resurrected body is not going to be like that. Why? Because he says this is a physical body, that's going to be a spiritual body. And so the day of resurrection is going to be the day that Hades will be empty of souls, the Hadean realm will be destroyed, and we will get our new resurrected bodies. Now somebody says, well now, what's going to happen to us? What if Resurrection Day came today? You told us what's going to happen to the people who are in the Hadean realm. What about if it happened today and we're still alive, what's going to happen to us? The Bible answers that. Listen, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That's the people of Hades. And we shall be changed. You know what that means? The dead are going to get their resurrected bodies, but those of us who are still living, we're going to be transformed into this new resurrected body. And then we're all going to be called before the presence of God for the judgment. This takes us to the next section of the chart, and this is the judgment day. The good and bad are going to be gathered together to stand before the throne of Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, 32 says, All nations shall be gathered before him, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides a sheep from the goats. And friends, I want you to know all of humanity. On that day, the rich man and Lazarus will stand before God to receive their eternal judgment. On that day, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will stand before God. On that day, Ahab, Jezebel, and Judas will stand before God. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. Sometimes people ask the question, What's the point of the judgment? Well, why go to the judgment anyway? Because if you've been in paradise or you've been in torment, it kind of seems like you've already been judged. You already know if you're going to go to heaven. You already know if you're going to go to hell. So what's the point of the judgment? But brother, I think that we, we've got a misunderstanding. Because we think of the judgment like it's a trial. And that's not what's not going to happen. On the day of judgment, God's not going to sit back and say, oh, does he get to heaven? No, no, does he, is he going to? That's not how it works. The moment we die, the Lord knows what our eternity is going to be. We could more properly call this the pronouncement of judgment day. You see, on that day, the Lord is going to state the reasons why a man is lost. The Lord will state the reasons why a man is saved. Now, somebody says, it still seems unnecessary. The righteous and the wicked already know where they're going to spend their eternity. I want to suggest to you very briefly, the judgment day is so very important for several reasons. Number one, for those of us who are still living, we haven't been in paradise or torment, so we don't know. It's important for us. Number two, the judgment day is important so that the righteousness of God may be displayed. And you say, what in the world are you talking about? I want you to think about this. The last time the world saw Jesus Christ, he was dying on the cross, condemned as a criminal. Now you say, no, remember, he was seen, he was seen by 500 disciples. The last time the world saw Jesus Christ, he was condemned as a criminal. But on that day, every eye shall see him as the righteous king. Number three, the resurrection day is going to be a day of exposure. 
Friends, the reasons why a man is lost will be stated. The reasons why a man is saved will be heralded. I do not believe there will be a single person in heaven who doesn't know why he is there. And likewise, I don't think there will be a single person in hell who doesn't know why he is there. You see, the judgment day is important because the Lord is going to state the reasons. Now that takes us to the last part of our chart here. And this is eternity. Matthew 25, 26 and these, the Lord says, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Man has been created in the image of God. That means I have a soul that will last forever. And have you ever stopped to think about that? The fact that you will never cease to exist? When you look at that, you see that there are two alternatives for where you will spend eternity. At the top, you have heaven. At the bottom, you have hell. The place at the top is a place of eternal bliss. It's the place the faithful will go. It is the place that the king references. Then shall the king say to them on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 46 calls it life eternal. At the bottom of the chart, you see the blackness, the fire, and the brimstone? It's hell. It's described in Revelation 21, 8 as the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, and it is the second death. It's the place the Lord has in mind in Matthew 25 when he says to the sinners, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. I'm hearing that it's getting popular with some young preachers now to say that hell is not going to be eternal, that you just are, are burned up and you cease to exist. Would you appreciate with me in Matthew 25, 46 when he says everlasting punishment and eternal life? The word everlasting and eternal are exactly the same Greek word. You see, the length of time that they will spend in hell is the same length of time we will spend in heaven. Heaven and hell will last for the same duration as eternal. How long is it be? Revelation 14 and verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot think of anything more terrifying than that. The man who dies and goes to hell has tomorrow and the next day and the next 100 years and the next million years to suffer and burn. And with each passing day, he never gets any closer to the end. It's like a clock that never moves. He will be there forever. Can you imagine lifting up your eyes and you realize, oh no, I just heard a sermon about this. And now it's too late. The soul enters man's body at the point of conception. For the next 70 or 80 years, that soul dwells in my tent. The body gets old, the body dies. The spirit leaves my body. It goes into the Hadean realm, either to paradise or torment, and it stays there until the day of resurrection. We will all stand before God in judgment, and then we will have our eternal sentence or our eternal reward. I want to tell you a true story and then I offer the Lord's invitation. I'm not going to give you the name for the privacy of family, but several years ago I was preaching in Charleston, South Carolina. And shortly before I moved from there, there was a member of our congregation who died. He had not been faithful to the church. His wife had not been faithful to the church. It had been months. On this particular Sunday night, he showed up, just the man, but he didn't come into the auditorium. He sat in the foyer. And I remember I preached out and I walked out and I saw him sitting there and he put his face in his hand and, and I thought, something's eating. I thought, he's going to make his life right tonight. But he didn't. I guess the next morning, maybe the day after, he got on his motorcycle to ride to work. It was raining. I don't know exactly what happened. Somebody told me maybe a car hit the rear wheel of his motorcycle and he lost control and his head smashed the pavement. He was not wearing a helmet. They sent a helicopter from the Medical University of South Carolina, and they met about him back to the hospital. As he was there, they called his wife, they called his family, and his wife went to the hospital. This was relayed by one of the elders. I wasn't there, but she knew they had not been faithful, and she didn't know what to do. She's desperate. As far as we knew, he was possibly brain dead. We did not know at the time. And so she talked to the doctor, can he hear me? Not knowing what else to do, she stood next to her husband and she held his hand and she said, I'm going to say a prayer asking that you be forgiven of your sins. And a Christian's got that right. She said, I'm going to say a prayer asking that you be forgiven of your sins. And if you can hear me and you agree, squeeze my hand. She didn't know what else to do. 
She said, I think he squeezed my hand. You say, why are you telling us this? Brethren, I'm telling you this because that brother was in his 40s when that happened. We think that the preacher comes and tells these hypothetical stories, these highly unlikely things, but that could happen to any one of us. We could leave this building tonight, and what happens when a car strikes you, and then you open your eyes, and you're in torment, and you think, just start sermon about this, and it's forever too late, and you can't change it. Right now, we are in the realm of the living. And right now, you can make a change. You can make sure you have fixed this. If you're not a New Testament Christian tonight, you can obey the gospel. You may say, I have never heard this. I don't know what to do. The Bible teaches you need to hear the gospel. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ and be baptized in water for remission of your sins. You say, you need to open the Bible and show it to me. We will. You tell us what to study tonight. Jeff will do it tonight. We'll do it tonight. Maybe you're here and you say, I am a Christian. I'm not walking in the light. I don't want to lift up my eyes tonight because I know what my eternity is going to be. Don't leave here. If you leave here tonight, I hope you will toss and turn in your bed and miss it until your life right. Maybe you're here this evening and you say, I want to come forward. I want my brethren to pray for me as I repent and I'm restored. And we would count it an honor to do that. I told you at the beginning we're going to come back to the end of the chart. At the beginning, you see two arrows. You've got the saved and the lost. These two groups are traveling two different paths. The saved are traveling the path that when they take the journey through death, they will enter into Christ. They will stand before God, and eternally they will go into heaven. Those who are in the category of the lost, that would be those who have never obeyed the gospel or unfaithful Christians. They will travel through death. They will lift up their eyes in torment. They will stand before God, hear the words, depart from me, and they will lift up their eyes. Tonight, I want to ask you the question, where do we go when we die? And the answer is, it depends on where you are, why you're living. Every person here tonight is about to make a choice. If you know the answer to this question and you like it, you can fix it tonight. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you help us together? We stand and sit in the invitation.